What if we can positively impact society by reshaping the mindsets of young men? And while we're at it, let me ask you, what does it mean to be a man? My name is Dennis Meralda, a father, a teacher, a coach, a mentor, and a principal with over two decades of experience shaping the minds and characters of young men across the United States. If these questions resonate, if you're a young man looking to improve your life or a parent looking for tools to help your son become the best version of himself, the Building Men Podcast was created for you. What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Building Men Podcast, or welcome back. If you have been here before, excited today to be joined by G.S. Youngblood. G.S. is the acclaimed author of two groundbreaking books. One is called The Art of Embodiment for Men. The other one is called The Masculine in Relationship, which challenges the modern notion that all masculinity is toxic by offering a model the masculine blueprint, which we will talk about on today's episode, for men to become grounded in their own power. His two books have sold nearly a combined 50,000 copies, and he's become a highly sought-after men's coach. GS, what's up, my man? Hey, Dennis. Thank you for having me on. Good morning to you. Oh, my pleasure, dude. It really, uh, it's good to meet you in person here today, or in person, in, in Zoom person world or whatever. Um, Followed along with what you're doing uh, peripherally, I'm really interested to dig into this conversation. Uh, so, start off like you say in the in the bio, you're a you're a men's coach. What exactly is that? What does that What does that mean? Being a men's coach. Well, there's I, I deal with men in relationship almost primarily. Um, to me, that's the the juiciest area to come in and help men. And there's there's so many men that have they're either flat or contentious or even toxic relationships. Yeah. And um, most of these guys are really good men. I mean, not everybody, but most of these guys are really good men. They really want to do right in their relationship, um, but they they can't figure out how. It seems like they can never please their partner. And what I can do is come in and help them see some of the dynamics that are at play here. And and more often than not, a lot of these relationship problems are um, a result of a lack of masculine feminine polarity. And we can get into that and I can describe what I mean by that. And what they what these guys start to realize is, oh, because they're not stepping into their own power, and, and again, we'll describe what that means, um, that is creating so the dynamics in the relationship they didn't even think would be connected to that. And so that is what I'm doing as a men's coach. Got it. Uh, yeah, well, so much there that we'll dive into. But let's take a, a ride back. We'll get in the DeLorean, go back in time. And uh, and figure out where you got started with this. So talk to us a little bit about who you were when you were a young man. Could be, you know, in that middle school, high school age range. Um, did you have any mentors, role models that got you interested in this? Or was it the result of your history that you got interested in in this work? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll say I didn't have the, I mean, I had a mentor in my own father in certain ways. Right. But not in this way. You know, not in the emotional, relational masculinity realm even though my father was very very masculine he it wasn't like he knew how to teach me how to do that um so that that came later in life I, I will say that um it was more so after my first marriage imploded this was about 14 years ago that it, that it finally ended um and it was a relationship that ended uh painfully for me and that pain was my motivation. The, the sting of what I considered to be failure uh, to not make the marriage work um, was my motivation to find a better way. I had become a nice guy at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, I was married to a very strong woman. And at the end of that thing, I had allowed myself to become emasculated. I was dancing around, just trying to keep the peace, to keep her happy. Yep. And really little did I know that was actually part of the problem in the relationship. But I didn't realize that because nobody had exposed me to that. And uh, the first exposure I got was David Data. I, I, I found the way of the superior man, somebody I had recommended. Yeah. And that just seemed like a light bulb for me, which it is for most men. Yeah, you're nodding as well. Yep. Um, so I went on a path. I actually went off and studied with David for, for a while. And um, that took me on a path of, of studying with different teachers in, the, in, the, in this domain and, and, and kind of adjacent domains as well. Um, and it's been a, you know, 16 year or more at this point, um, growth path based on digging into this work. And I was fortunate enough for, for over a decade of that time to be in relationship with a woman who I'm with now. 
um, who has a very strong masculine from her father and a very strong feminine. So she's a powerhouse, um, but also has a huge heart. And so I've gotten a real life laboratory on what works in relationship, what creates more connection and strength and what doesn't. And, and so the, really the combination of those two has been my path for the last 16 years. Um, and about four or five years ago, um, I, all the things that I had learned culminated in a very big pile of notes that got compiled into the book, The Masculine in Relationship. And what I wanted to do was give men, any man, yep. a model of masculinity. I wanted to give them a model of masculinity that they could embody. You don't have to be taller or smarter or wealthier or better looking or any of those things that guys might think they need to be quote unquote more masculine. Anybody can embody this thing that I call the masculine blueprint and come into their own masculine power. And guess what? In, in, in the process of that, they're going to solve a lot of their relationship problems. To learn more about our programs, including one-on-one -on -one mentorship coaching, the foundation, our Building Men Online group community for young men, or to bring a Building Men experience to your school, check out our website, buildingmen.io, or click the links in the bio. Now, back to the show. We'll definitely get into that masculine blueprint that you refer to, GS, but let's let's first unpack the whole idea of the nice guy. It's something that I have talked about on this podcast, the the seeking of approval, the people pleasing, that idea. I live that life as well. It was and looking at it now, I'm like, I don't recognize the man that I was at that point in my life. And it makes me cringe thinking about it as well. I've never done an episode just focusing on that. So let's spend a little time digging into what exactly is a nice guy when you refer to it. You hear like, oh, be nice to your sister, be nice to this person. And you think it's a good thing. But when you start to dig into it, you realize it's really not. It's it's more about manipulation. It's more about covert contracts. So talk to us a little bit about what is a nice guy and how did you break free from it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let's give a shout out to Dr. Robert Glover. He, he wrote the book on this, No More Mr. Yep. Nice Guy. Yep. Everybody gets the book. That's the seminal book, in my opinion. Probably even, I used to think it was David's. I think I think Robert's book, because yep. it's so simple and so accessible for guys to turn the light on um, of, of around this, this behavior called nice guy behavior. Um, here's here, Nice guys, as Robert writes, nice guys um, are men that pretend they don't have needs and they try to meet everybody else's needs, but inside they're seething because they're not getting their needs met because they're never, they're never admitting that they actually have needs. And so um, these guys who are nice are actually probably kind of assholes on the mm -hmm. inside at times. Not always, but you know, that tends to be the archetype, but here, let me go a, a cut deeper. Of yeah. We're talking about a nice guy. A nice guy is somebody that is, is scared. They probably were wounded in their childhood. You know, there's some form of, of either needing to stay out of trouble so they want to keep a low profile or needing to please a parent that never could be pleased when they were kids, something in that, in that vein. So nice guys have their radar out. This is how I always explain it. They have their radar out. They're looking for relational danger, any way that they're going to upset somebody else or not meet somebody else's needs. And so their, their radar is turned up to 11 yeah. And they're like, okay, what can I do? That's the safe thing to do that will make everybody happy. So everything will be okay. And that, that's really, they walk around, they don't realize it, but they are vigilant and they are good at reading the signs and the subtleties of people's displeasure because they had to, it's just like a deer is very tuned to its environment. It's not going to let something sneak up on it. That's how nice guys are. So the antidote to being a nice guy is simply this, simply take some of that awareness that is riveted externally and turn it internally. What is it that you need? What is it that you want and prefer? What are your boundaries? What do you think the moment calls for? What do you think the people that you care for and are taking care of, what do they also need as well? And you start to develop an inner clarity, which is something that a lot of nice guys do not have. They do not have inner clarity. So you've got to start to develop that muscle of inner clarity. And then you start to express that externally as direction and structure for the world around you. And that's the, you know, that's kind of the short version of, of how I describe what's going on under the surface right. of nice guys. Agreed. And most of the things that are going on are disingenuous. It is, there's a level of what am 
what can I say or do that will get me what I want without having to be direct in communicating yeah. it that because being afraid of being rejected, if you say that this is what I really need in a specific situation, it's, it really is for young men listening right now, those two books, no more Mr. Nice guy and um, the way of the superior male five years ago. Now, maybe six years ago, right around that time frame, I found both of the books. I read them and I listened to the audio book of both of the books as well. As I was following along, one of the biggest game changers, I would say, is finding those uh, congruently, reading both of them at the same time and working through them. So I appreciate you saying that. Highly recommend both books as well. So you mentioned, GS, about you know having this idea of no more Mr. Nice Guy. We want to get away from that. I think what happens is boys right now are, one, unsure of what it means to be a man in the world. They're really, it's, it's, it's very difficult for them to understand and almost feeling as though they have to apologize for being born with a penis. Like, okay, I'm so sorry that I've, you know, uh, perpetuated all of these histrionic things into the world. And so how would you talk to a young man? Say, I'm a, I'm a kid, I'm in, you know, my sophomore, junior year of high school, and I'm really unsure of what it means to be a man. How would you describe masculinity to them? Because it is, a, it's a, an ambiguous term right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, pop, because of the pain that, yeah, we have inflicted over thousands of years. Yeah. We can't, you know, nobody's denying that. Um, there's been this, the pendulum swung so hard the other way that, as you said, everybody's scared. And, yep. and people have conflated masculinity with toxicity, like we talked about before we started the show. My, my book, The Masculine Relationship, is my offering for the answer to your question. So I'm going to describe it. it, it the answer is the masculine blueprint. I wanted to give, oh, well, I guess I already said it. So, you know, I wanted to give the world a, a, a model that didn't step on anybody's sovereignty, um, doesn't, uh, it does coexist with the Me Too world that we lived in, we live in right now. Um, so I'm going to describe the masculine blueprint yeah, as, perfect. as my answer to your yep. question. Here's what I say. Here's the short version. And, and this is this is primarily in relationship, but I think we're talking about young men, so that they might not be. So that can it can also apply to the world itself. It's very simple. Number one, three parts. Number one, get grounded. If you're a guy that's very reactive, you get very defensive, people get upset with you, and you, you kind of slobber over yourself to to, to 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 explain why you didn't mean it like that and, and why it was, you know, they have their facts wrong. That's not a guy that's that's grounded. So number one is get grounded. Kind of ground your nervous system and bring a quality of stillness and choicefulness to your way of being. That's something that, that everybody around you feels. It starts to, starts to regulate their nervous systems too. So when everybody else is all jacked up, your grounded nervous system will help co-regulate their grounded nervous system. So that's one. Number two, lead more. So bring leadership. This is where guys get themselves in a lot of trouble. They, they start to identify as easygoing guys. Oh yeah, I'm just an easygoing guy. I just go with the flow. Guys, the world wants your masculine leadership. That's, this is your gift, your clarity that you can bring, the structure that you can bring. People are looking for somebody to lead them. Not everybody's leader. People love when somebody steps up and, and heartfully leads the group and then finally there's a direction to take. So your leadership and clarity is a gift. Now, I always say, I'm, we're not talking about domineering. We're not talking about control. See, that's where people will try to bastardize these concepts. It's not domineering. It's not control. It, your leadership is an invitation. I, I, I have a, a clear vision of where I think we should go. Are you with me? That's, that's inclusive leadership. You're, it's as invitation, not control. So the more that you can bring clarity and structure while you fold in everybody else's needs as well, so it's inclusive, that's a gift to the world. So lead more as the second uh, part of the masculine blueprint. And then build connection and safety. What that means is, particularly in relationship, you know, you've got to have an emotional connection with your partner. And this is where a lot of guys get, it, get, it, uh, get themselves in trouble is they they're like, you know, a lot of adult men are like, I work all day. I provide for the family. What more do you need from me? Why are you so upset with me, honey? And what the, the women in, in, in a lot of these cases, they need more emotional connection in the relationship. They need to feel emotionally safe in the relationship, which often means that their emotions are validated by their partner. 
So I, this is where I spend a lot of time with men because it's, it's probably the part that's the hardest for most men. Yeah. How do you build a strong emotional connection with your partner? So that's the, that's the three-part framework. That's what I would say to guys. Like if you want to be masculine, get grounded. And we'll talk about what that means. I hope number two is lead more. And, two, and three is build connection for the, with those around you and help them feel emotionally safe. That's going to pay dividends big time. And that's what I would recommend to, to men. All tremendous pieces of advice there, GS. So we'll start with the grounded piece, right? One thing I, as I talk to young men, I, I see that they struggle with in relationships. It, it boils down to what you just said with, with being grounded. And a lot of it, and I talk to them about responding versus reacting. Okay. And that's a that's a big piece. And I know, especially for a young man who's involved in his first relationship, it might be the first time that he's getting laid. And that is the be all end all for him. Right. And like that becomes he might drop his friends, you know, stop playing sports because the power of the P it's pulling him in that direction. And it, the young men become very reactionary where if they're um, their significant other, their partner is upset. Well, what do I do wrong? How do I fix this? And you, it's almost like this frenetic way that they have about them. So if a, if a young man is struggling with that right now, and the whole idea of being grounded is a foreign thing, what are a couple yeah. steps that he might be able to take to start honing in on the, in that direction? Well, let's do a visualization first yeah. of what we're talking about. You know, so to the young man, this is what I'm offering you. Just think of different people that you know, and there's that guy that's, he's he's a little bit kind of, you know, he's every stimulant of the world kind of gets him all jacked up and he talks fast and he, he doesn't really think through things. Um, and he gets defensive. Uh, you know, you know a person like this and they're just, as you use the word, Dennis, frenetic. There's a little bit of freneticism. Yeah. I like that. And you know, we write that off as, oh yeah, that's just, that's just Johnny, you know, that's just his kind of way of being. It's not attractive. And what I mean by attractive is not attractive to women. It, and it's not attractive to the world at large to look to you as, as somebody they trust and as a leader. Now, turn your attention now to somebody who you know in your life and they, they move a little slower, not because they're, they're limited in their mental capacity, but they're, um, they're, they pause, consider, and then choose. And they just, they move a little slower in the world in a good way. A guy like that is, is more likely than not much more trustable. It feels like he's choosing rather than just kind of popping off and playing out a script and, and getting scared and defending himself and anything like that. That's the man that, that you want to be. So you know, I, you asked me to do a, give them a couple of things. I'd say, here's an easy one. You don't even have to, to invest in this. When you speak and when you're in conversation with people, pause before you answer anybody. So if somebody says, da 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 you pause. Okay, I hear that. And da 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 And just pause before you choose. Because the, the, the person that is like stumbling over themselves to just respond to you, um, it doesn't feel powerful. It doesn't feel trustable. It doesn't make me really tune into their words because it just feels like they're just popping off and, and being very uh, being very reactionary. That's number one. For a longer term investment in yourself and your grounding your nervous system, the thing that I teach men is around embodiment exercises. And so um, these, it's, these exercises are combinations of breathing and movement and visualization and, and things like that. It's beyond meditation. And they're all designed to ground your nervous system and kind of just slow you down. Because when your nervous system is grounded, you, you will naturally slow down. And I think, you know, it's kind of like how you and I are talking. I think both mm -hmm. of us have a certain, a certain measuredness to how we, we, uh, we talk. And, and that's what I'm talking about. And you can start to cultivate that through a daily practice of embodiment exercise, which, by the way, was the, the subject of my second book, The Art of Embodiment. So those are two things that I would offer around getting grounded to, to young men. I appreciate that. I love the pause. When young men are in a conversation, we work through conflict and it could be with a, a partner. It could be with another, a, a friend that jerk off in the hallway that's saying stuff to piss you off, a teacher, whoever. Um, I talk about that. Just being in control 
of your words being really specific. Our words are it's such a tool that we have and how we use our voice to communicate those words. And I'll often tell young men as well, if somebody says something cutting to you, like in a really dicky way, and they're coming after you, they're breaking your balls. And you, it, there's a difference between buddies breaking your balls and then someone who's, you know, has a um, mal intent. I'll often say, pause, look at them in the eye and say, can you repeat that? <laughs> and good. just by them, just by them doing that, a lot of times people are like, oh man, I was just kidding. Uh, you know, just by taking a moment, because then you take the power back from that person. And now you, they're, the second time they say it, it doesn't have as much emphasis if they do repeat it. The young men I've talked to about that, they're like, that works almost every single time. So I just wanted to add that in there. I've never really talked about it on the podcast. This, the second thing that you talk about, GS, is for them to lead more. What if it's a kid who is inherently introverted by nature? If if stepping up in front of the group is not something that he feels very comfortable with initially, is there any anything that you might recommend? Because I do 100% agree with you. When I work with a group of young men in a school, every single time we're together, they are all speaking publicly. And I said, it's, it's such an art to be able to talk with confidence in front of a group. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is by going through sucking at it. You have to suck at it first before you get really good at it. So let's, let's do that together. So if somebody's interested in becoming more of a leader, and hopefully the, the young men that are listening, that's something that's in, you know, in their future. How would you recommend that they do that? Are there any steps that they can take, any challenges that you can put in front of them? Yeah, uh, I think you, what you're talking about, like how could a guy that's that's maybe a little more introverted stand up in front of a group and really show himself and express himself? And yeah, I do a lot of, I help a lot of people with public speaking. And, and really it's, you have to go back to step one and get more grounded because mm -hmm. what happens is you get up there these guys, if they were to get in front of a group before they're ready, and their attention is is like looking at everybody for, are they okay? Are they doing okay? Are, am I? Do they approve of me? If they don't, I'm going to be crushed. And so there's it's that that radar turned up to eleven pointed externally again. Um, this is just a different context than what we were talking about before, and. And from that place of like, oh my God, am I okay? As reflected through the eyes of other, they're, they're doomed to fail. And they have such a fear in their body. So their whole nervous system is jacked and they're, and they're again, their their attention is out on 10. So you got to go back to the nervous system work. I'd say, hey, if you're one of those kids, get on my program and, and do embodiment work for six months. I mean, do it for the rest of your life, but start with six months um, it's going to start to ground your nervous system. And so you're going to be able to stand up in front of other people. And then I, then I coach people when they're up there, they need to, they need to really start to play with their awareness instead of having it pointed out. Like I've been talking about, put a little awareness on your sense of weight as you are standing. And so that it's through your feet, you feel the sense of weight pressing down. That's a sensation. Mm -hmm. You can feel your weight right now because of gravity. So feel a little bit of that while you're speaking. And also one of the tricks I give people is to feel the what's called the back body. So put a little awareness kind of on your back because usually it's in our front and we feel very vulnerable to the mm -hmm. to the crowd's approval or disapproval. So if you put a little bit of awareness on your on your back body while you're in front of a crowd, it actually kind of it dampens down that that sensitivity you have to the audience that is in front of you. So there's, there's lots of techniques that you can do. A lot of them relate to how you play with your awareness. Um, these are things that I, that I teach guys about how to, how to be more successful when they go up and stand in front of a group and, and do public speaking. So that's, that's part of the advice that I would share. And then the last one you were talking about is building connection and, and safety. And I do think in a relationship, uh, and we can start to talk about polarity right now, masculine, feminine energies and polarities. I think women, and you, you had mentioned in your previous relationship and even your current relationship, um, women have the, the capability to embody that feminine, but if they have to take on a masculine role and be the, the, you know, the tougher one in the relationship and handle the, the difficult situations, they can certainly do that, but I don't think they want to, I think they, they want to stay in that feminine presence, but what they need is a, a masculine man to help them do that, you know, to work together. So talk to us a little bit about relationship dynamics, that polarity that you were speaking about before. Yeah, it's, it, and let's be clear, we're not talking about what anybody should do. What, what we're talking about is situations in which 
there's a man who wants to inhabit masculine energy and his partner, maybe female, but maybe she's not, not in our modern world, doesn't matter, but somebody who wants to, I'll say somebody who wants to inhabit the feminine pole. Mm -hmm. And the masculine pole is direction, you know, the feminine pole is receptivity, responsiveness, energy, um, and they're, they're energies that are different. And so let's just talk about a situation where a guy wants to uh, inhabit the masculine pole and his partner wants to inhabit the feminine pole. When when that doesn't happen, the, the feminine partner starts to get a little crunchy. As you said, of course, women and feminine beings can also inhabit their masculine as well and bring it, and they should. Um, but in those times of intimacy, when they want to relax back a little bit more into his direction, they want to surrender temporarily a little bit more in his direction, and he's not stepping up, it's so disappointing to the feminine. It's so disappointing. And that that disappointment translates into a lot of the um, dysfunctional relationship dynamics that a lot of men experience in the relationship. She gets a little irritable. She gets critical. That's one that, that usually comes up in, in these adult relationships. They, they, the feminine, if, it, if the feminine is, is forced to be the leader, um, th there can also be a lack of respect and a loss of interest in sexuality. I mean, these are the complaints that guys yeah. have. There can be a, a disrespect and kind of a condescension from their feminine partner, all translating from that disappointment that, that the feminine partner feels because he's not stepping up. He's not inhabiting that masculine pole. And so, you know, a guy comes to me, he's like, my wife doesn't want to have sex with me. And she's always crabby and irritable and she puts me down. Like, what do I need to do to, so that she wants to have sex with me more? I'm like, whoa, what you need to do is start to realize how you're not stepping up. And let me show you three examples from your life that you've shared with me. Um, and so I get the guys to see that uh, things that don't seem like they're related to this polarity actually, in fact, are related to this polarity. And those are some of the reasons why. So in a situation, um, what would be step one then? I know, like not giving away all your secrets or whatever. So I'm a guy that comes to you, and th those are the complaints that I have. And obviously, you'll you'll turn the mirror back on me. I'll have to go through and and share scenarios. But is there a a step one? Is it do you just go through like okay, we're gonna start by grounding, we're gonna start there, and then work off of that, or is it like every day just do? If you say you're gonna do something, do that one thing every single day. So we'll start there. Do you have a a starting point? Yeah, the beauty of the blueprint is is the blueprint is often yeah. the answer. The question, and it is in this case, just do three things, men. Get grounded, which means start a daily embodiment practice. There's other parts to it, and that's what I go through in the book, yeah. but the embodiment practice is the one. If, if that means that you do a five-minute breathing exercise every morning while you lay in bed before you get out of bed, then that's that's a good start. It may not, it's not complete, but it's a good start. Um and there's specific breathing exercises, not just any breath exercise. Um, number two, lead more. So start to really develop a sense of inner clarity by turning that radar internally now and start to build that muscle. Like, what do I think is needed here? And then offer that as, as direction and structure externally to the world around you uh, in an inclusive way, not a domineering way. Number three, build emotional connection with your woman. That There's two easy ways to build emotional connection. One is receive her emotional expressions more cleanly, make space for them, hold them more than you do now. And number two, show what's inside of you. Most men are absolutely opaque, are, you know, especially men and teenage boys, to be honest. How you doing? I'm fine. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. Like I got it. You know, I got the world handled. We all know that fine is the average of a bunch of stuff that's great and a bunch, a bunch of stuff that's kind of hard. So start to share some of that richness of your inner experience. Then you will build emotional connection with, with your feminine partner. I guarantee it. So that's the answer that I say to guys, like, live the blueprint. That is your answer. Live the blueprint. Any man can do it. You do not have to be special or exceptional to do it. You can start today. You can start in this moment. Yep. Right now, as soon as you hit stop on the episode, you could start immediately. I want to take a quick step back into the idea in schools. Uh, right now, the, the work that I'm doing in schools, I work with, it's typically middle schools and in high schools. And I go in and I'm, I'm working with uh, a, groups of boys at least once a month throughout the entire school year. And I recognize that one, schools are not set up for boys. 
It just they're not they're not built in a way that I I really believe gets the most out of young men. Um, and then too, like I mentioned before, boys are feeling like they have to constantly look over their shoulder and apologize for everything that they're doing. So now say you have an opportunity, GS, you're going to come and be a guest speaker at a building men workshop in uh, a high school in North Jersey, and you could teach these boys. Uh, so take the blueprint out of it right now. Right. So like, well, obviously, well, that would be something that we would get into, but if there was either a, a skill that you think boys should come out of out of school with it could be a character trait that you really want to live on lean on a daily habit like what's something that you'd be like i have an hour with a group of 100 boys this is something that i'm really going to dive in and help them understand hmm well, you took away my best answer by saying take the blueprint out of it <laughs> well i mean you I could say, jump into one of those things but see yourself see yourself so don't go talking about it like this young men but see yourself has the, I don't know if this is the right phrase that I would use, but like the benevolent father, serve, like our fathers, let's look at what our father, let me look at what my father did. Yeah. He had all kinds of foibles and quirks and, you know, and, and tough parts, but that man took care of me. He looked out for my well-being and he was competent and he led us and he cared for us um, and he served us. Do that for, for everybody in your life, you know, serve others, not in a uh, subjugated way. I don't mean that. That's right. this, please others. This is very different. Serving mm -hmm. others and leading others. Give them the gift of leadership. And I know that ties into the blueprint a little bit, but just it's how you see yourself is you're not an easygoing guy. Yeah, whatever you want. You're not apologetic and shrinking. You're big in the world and you, I'm a force for good in the world and I'm going to help other people. So if I see somebody struggling, I'm going to offer to help. This is my son, uh, one of my kids, my youngest. I mean, uh, sorry, no, this is my oldest. When he was in high school, he would just willingly help other kids with their math homework, kids that were struggling. And he did it out of his own sense of kindness. It was a beautiful, I mean, I, I, it was a beautiful manifestation of what I'm talking about. He saw people that were struggling and he said, I'm going to help these people. Um, it's a quality that, a, that, that like a first responder has. They put their life on the line for other people. And you don't have to do it that dramatically. But to see yourself in service of the world, using your power, groundedness, yep. and leadership and clarity, that is a brilliant thing to do. I love that. I think it's great advice. It's one of the things, one of the monthly challenges that we have in a building men group is do something kind for another human being without any expectation of reciprocation. So you're not doing it to get the extra allowance, to get the hand job, to get the extra scoop of ice cream, whatever it is, you're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Something as simple as you go to the the grocery store and there's seven shopping carts that some jackass just left out you know and go and put the shopping carts away like do something that will just help humanity even in some small way and those things like you mentioned gs and that's so cool that your son did that it starts a ripple effect one the boys understand like wow that felt good me doing something for another person and then the people that are observing that especially if they're stepping into that leadership potential that they have other people will be like wow, I just saw GS's son do that. I'm going to do something like that as well. And that can have like a, a, an enormous impact on a community. Yeah, and, and I'll say this for the young men. You, you, you will be amazed at the respect that people start to uh, uh, acquire for you when you do these things without, without trying to show people. It's just you do them because you want to do them and people will notice and they'll start to respect you more. And imagine what it's like, young men, to go through life as a as a young man that other people respect other young ladies yep. other young men your teachers everybody starts to respect you more because they see you as that as that precocious leader that's that's a good way to go through life absolutely i agree with that so let's talk then about you had mentioned before uh the the men that are like i'm fine i'm fine everything is good we all do that right because we don't want to be a burden especially you know we get to a spot in our life we don't want to be a burden on other people i often speak to young men about the courage to be vulnerable and the courage to like look at yourself in a more critical way and share the things that are going on 
But there's also, you mentioned before, GS, that pendulum, right? We don't want to be such an emotional burden on another person where we're constantly in our feels, but we also can't be that we're just a hunk of granite and there's, you know, we're never going to show any kind of emotion because that will come out, as you know, in drinking and gambling and drugs and watching pornography in a million different buffering type behaviors because people are unable to deal. So what advice would you give to a young man as well who is like, you know, I understand I'm feeling these emotions. I need to be able to share it, but how do I go about doing it? How do I express a level of vulnerability in a courageous way? You know, it's 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 very, very simple to explain. It's always harder to do, but it's easy right. to explain. We don't want to be a burden, as you said. And so we go immediately to I'm fine, which means we just put the yep. clamp down on the whole thing. And we don't feel anything overtly. We feel it underneath, but we, we don't feel it overtly. And that's our way to get to, I can handle this and, I'm, and I don't want to burn you, so I'm not going to. That's kind of those masculine tricks. All, I'm, all I would say is you can still get to the point of like, I, I can handle this and I don't want to be a burden. But, but open up a few steps before that, which means, number one, allow yourself to consciously feel it deeply. So instead of putting the clamps down before you feel, allow yourself to feel your sadness, your fear, your shame, whatever it is, your joy. It doesn't always have to be the darker emotions. And then own that you feel sadness, fear, shame, joy. Express it to somebody in a, in a succinct way. And then come in with a but... I can handle this. So it's like, I, I am, you know, I'm mortified because, you know, so-and-so put this picture of me on, on Snapchat, you know, or whatever, whatever's going to create some shame or yeah. something, you know, like, God, I just, I feel so, I feel so embarrassed. This is painful. Whew. Okay. But I can handle this. So you allow yourself to feel it. You allow yourself to express it to somebody who's trusted, but then you come in with the, but I can handle this. And that's, it's more of the scenic route to get to that point where you're not a burden, because that is where, when we put our emotionality and we kind of barf it on somebody and we expect them to do something to make us feel better, that's where it starts to feel needy. And that's where we don't want to go, at least if we can help it. So that's what I would say. It's just, don't go immediately to the clamp down, I'm fine. Feel it deeply. Develop, and this is something I work with men on in, in some of my live workshops, is just that that we practice actually feeling. Mm -hmm. These guys sometimes don't even know how to feel, and so we have to practice it. And so allow yourself to feel deeply. I've, I, I can say I've cultivated myself into a man that can feel things really deeply. And I can express it succinctly. I don't, I don't barf it. I don't go on and on. Just express it succinctly. And then you know, handle it, bring in that, that mask on, but I can handle this. You know, I will get through this. I'm going to feel it and I'm going to suffer a little bit, but I will get through it. And I don't need other people to kind of fix me or, or change to make me feel better. Right. I think that's my answer. I, uh, I appreciate that. And I like the taking a moment, breathing through it, really feeling what you feel. I would add some of the advice that I give is then get it out of your head onto a piece of paper, journal about it, write it down, because just the process of doing that, you'll start to find certain patterns of, of thoughts, of actions, of behaviors, and it might be connected to something you didn't even realize. So being able to do that, the next piece is to, to be able to then ask for help if necessary. Uh, if you're in a spot, especially if you're in your teenage years, you might be in a situation where I got this, I got this, I got this. And once you're able to process through, I need a little more support in this area or that area. And it's not a weakness to ask for assistance or for help. If you get to that point, obviously we want to develop the skills to be able to do that for ourselves, which is the importance of having a tribe as a young man. So I'm going to, I'm going to slightly shift. And this is something that Maybe you're a coach now helping me in, in men's work deal with a question that I am currently pondering in my own life, and my own relationship. And that is, can men and women be friends, be best friends? Can I have a female best friend? Can my partner have a male best friend? Is that something that is possible in the world or does attractiveness get in the way does it, it's just something that i'm that, that i've been thinking about currently and i'd love to hear what your thoughts are on it 
Oh man, what a question. Um, well, it depends. Unfortunately, I have to, I have to go with the, it depends. Um, it's really, it's like what's going on underneath. Um, it does matter about the attractiveness of the people involved. I mean, it just, I just, I think it does. I, I'm, I'll say, I start as a skeptic that men and women of commensurate attractiveness can actually be true friends without any sexual connection existing. I don't mean sexual manifesting, but with, with there's something underneath, you know, there's a little bit of chemistry there. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a skeptic that it can. I, I think it, it's possible, but probably less likely. Um, the thing that comes to mind is if, if like I was, if like, let's say my partner, she had a male friend that she spent a lot of time with who was, you know, commensurately attractive. I would want to know, what are you getting from that? Is it because if she's outsourcing some need and it's just kind of going and finding it somewhere else, maybe he's more talkative than me or, or, you know, whatever, like something that he has that maybe I'm, I'm less so. I'd want to explore that with her because that's something she needs to bring into the relationship and share that as a need rather than outsourcing that to, to other men, even if it's supposedly platonic. So that, that's where the it depends comes in is I really want to explore that with the woman. And uh, yeah, and, and th the other part of this is the way I look at this is, is that other person on our team? You know, is this a, is this a man that I've never met? And never comes by the house or is he somebody who's is, you know in our friend group and is friends with us and um and it doesn't mean that friends can't portray you but um it does mean that if if the person is kind of a third party out there versus somebody that's in our field and rooting for us those are very different so those are all parts of the it depends yes and that's where i i currently sit in my own uh you know pondering of that idea as well and i think a lot of it has to do with just historically so if it's you were friends with a female in middle school and you've gone through high school together and were in each other's wedding parties and all this stuff and you're still friends in your 40s that's one thing but right now if you were to go out to starbucks and meet a woman oh she's uh, Great. We had such a good conversation about the latte that we both ordered, and I'm going to go out for coffee with her once a week right now. That's a different story to me. So it all depends on the, the timing of it as well. It's just something that's been at the forefront of something that I'm thinking about in my own life right now. And I'm trying to determine how I really feel about it. And what I do, GS, is immediately I'll have my snap judgment about it, like no or yes. And then I take some time to, okay, unpack why is this the case i don't have any female friends i had two sisters that were close in age to me so i i feel like i had that need met of if i needed to get a feminine perspective i could talk to my sisters we're still very close uh so it wasn't something that i felt was an important thing and i feel like if i need that feminine energy my my partner is meeting that for me right now so again it was just i appreciate you you know walking us through that that little journey there again it was something on my own mind right now um yeah. Before I ask my last question to you, GS, and this might go in a couple of different directions. Uh, first, I would, would love to know how we can find you. Where do we get your books, your stuff? To talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, the best way to, you can see a nice cross-section of my, the way I look at things by, uh, well, actually read the book, I would say. Go to Amazon, The Masculine Relationship. It's the easiest way to get connected to my work. Um, and beyond that, you can look on Instagram, GS Youngblood, M-I-R, Masculine in Relationship, M-I-R. Um, so you can see me talking about lots of topics and some of the snippets from the many podcasts that I've done. Um, beyond that, gsyoungblood.com, that's where you can see my offerings. Uh, the one that I'm most excited about is my boot camp. I take 12 men through a, a process. Uh, it would be fun. It would be fun to, to get 12 young men, Dennis, and take them through this, this process and adapt the material. Like maybe we should talk about that. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the boot camp is, is, is the program I'm most excited about, but there's other offerings there that I have a video course, which is great. Um, and, uh, that's the best way to find out the offerings that I've gotten some of my, some of my philosophies as well. So that's where you can find me. Love that. So what I'll do right now is I'll just throw this offer out there to those of you that are listening to this podcast. I'll put all that information in the in the show notes. But uh, the first email that I get, buildingmencoach at gmail.com, 
Um, the first email that I get with the subject line, we'll call it masculine blueprint, put that in the subject line. I will send you a copy of GS's book, the masculine in relationship. That's on me. Uh, last question that I like to ask is if someone's listening to this episode, one, a ton of value they've already received from listening to you talking about the blueprint, your framework, grounding yourself, leading more, building connections and safety, how you help young men understand what's in front of them in relationships and how to embody uh, the best version of themselves. Tremendous information there. But I'm listening to this podcast, GS, and I, I hit stop right after this question is, is done being answered. And there's one thing that I can do. And by doing this one thing, it could really change the trajectory of my life. Besides buying your book and your courses and everything like that, what's another thing that someone could do right now if they press stop? Start, start an embodiment practice. I know I said that like five times already, but it's it's still the answer. Um, everything in your life gets easier when your nervous system is, is more grounded. Everything. You start to create a spaciousness in you where you can not only kind of notice how you're being, but also course correct to become more the man that you want to be moment to moment, how you want to speak and respond and be with others. All that comes from having a little bit of that spaciousness that an embodiment practice that creates. And then that can be a very simple practice. So I would say that is the answer a hundred times out of my own Love that. Um, one thing that, that really resonated before we, we, uh, we say goodbye here is when you think about the type of man that you want to be, instead of what do you want to do with your life? You know, that's something that we're often asked in that middle school and high school age range. It's, who is the man that you want to be? And then if you become that man, what is he capable of accomplishing? It's a, it's a totally different thing. And, and I've gone through this practice myself as I had to have a really, really difficult, heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching conversation with my father. Um, what I said before the conversation is, if I was courageous in this conversation, what would I do? Or what would the most courageous person, courageous version of me do in this conversation? And this level of calm came over me and I was able to handle a really challenging situation and wow. conversation with my father by going through that. So I, I totally, uh, from my own experience, will attest to the, the power in that. GS Youngblood, my man, I really appreciate this. I'm really happy we're able to connect. I've been following along with your work. I'm going to read the book. I'd love to have you back on after I've got an opportunity to like dig into it and really uh, you know, embody the practices that you were talking about. Um, for the Building Men audience, if you got any level of value from this episode, consider rating the podcast, reviewing it. More than anything else, share this out with anyone that you think might get some level of value from our conversation. Go one step further than you thought you could go. We'll see you next time on Building Men.